Yeah. You know, can I, can I, can I, but can I pause you here, Dolores? Because one of the, the important things that is coming out, and I can see some of the comments, is that there has been such a negative association with the scientific um, industry and the question about the financial gain and issues about whether or not everything is only for financial gain and whether or not there is a genuine interest in patients. How does the scientific community overcome that? Because at the moment, the public are now looking at the whole of the scientific and medical community in the same way. How is that fixed? So I guess, Philip, that's an, a very good question. And the thing is, when I did my uh, initial, so I was in the Max Planck, maybe 95, 96, 97, and uh, Professor Hans Lerich and that whole, you know, Max Planck were world leaders in the Human Genome Project. And so with many others, we decided that in order to fix this exact problem that's happening today, it's relatively easily fixed. And I was one of the people who would help write that grant because when I was checking that the antibodies weren't working and my technology was able to check whether an antibody was accurate or not, I immediately said that if this um, grant was funded, that I would put everything that I had done into what's called a public center and that anyone could order my tools of the high content protein arrays that cost a lot to make, but they were made available to people free, order whatever antibody that I did on my publication and repeat the experiment. And if I was doing anything wrong or fraudulent, they could publish it and challenge me, right? So we, the grant became the resource center of the German Human Genome Project and the German government funded 40 technicians over 10 years and made everything that was done in the Human Genome Project in those years was, we had to, and we're glad to transfer it to this resource center. And all of the tools were uh, freely, given freely all around the world to advance the technology because we were being funded by the um, men and women who were paying taxes in Germany, right? Which is the right thing to do. But that is how you then can check if a scientist is accurate or not, or, or a physician or a doctor, right? And the reason that you do it is there's often competing labs, right? And competing surgeons and competing doctors. So if someone, you know, Philip, is in an area that you're doing research and you have planned and you've got grant funding to do an area of research that you've planned for five years, but if Dolores in a lab in Ireland or Berlin does something that makes your entire research program with your two PhD students obsolete. Mm. This way allows that if Philip says, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure if this, this is unbelievable work, that if you're required to put everything that I have published into a public repository, then Philip can go and repeat it. And if it's not accurate, he can then submit a publication and say, I don't think what she did. So why I now have a lot of standing around you know, why I came out in 2020 was saying that um, we need to get the, the things that were the main tools of the unlawful lockdown were the PCR testing and also this program that came out of Imperial College um, and the existence, which we don't have to go into, of whether this COVID-19 existed or not, right? And of course, why I came out and said, I challenged them to say, well, all you have to do is supply the PCR testing and the uh, COVID, the, the causative agent, I was calling it, of what they were calling uh, COVID-19 and the PCR testing, right? And also I knew because I had studied it that vitamin D, vitamin C and zinc were preventative entirely so that even if people were predisposed to cold and flu-like symptoms, morally and ethically, but also under the law, under the natural law, physicians and politicians and regulators must prevent harm in the law, right? So the law is very simple. You act in honor and do no harm. And that men and women have a right to life, travel, speech, privacy, and private property. But under the right to life, which is inherent and inalienable, 
that includes your right to bodily integrity and your right to full, free and informed consent. So let's take the example of the testing. So you have the physician in law, right? And you have the woman who's a patient. So there's two things going on. The physician is liable if they use a test that the physician has not checked is accurate, right? The physician, nobody else. And the patient, if the physician administers a test and it is not accurate, the physician, the, the, and is not given the information when it was obvious that it wasn't accurate, then the patient in law has not been given full, free, and informed consent, which is an assault on their bodily integrity, which comes under the right to life. I really am very interested in what you said about the scientific integrity, because when you have proper scientific integrity, what happens is that every question is addressed in a systematic and consistent way. And an example I would give, without going into too much details because of the controversy, I can't talk about it here, but when stories come about, say, um, with the embalmers seeing abnormal patterns, the scientific approach would be to go and look at it in detail. If you were hearing about that there were more people who were having, as you said, the 51 people who may have died and so on, there should normally be a standard move to look and study some of these patterns. But what we have seen coming through with the pandemic is that there doesn't seem to be that check, that natural check that you would expect. I'm trying to work out how do we get that kind of probity back to protect the scientific position. Because as I said, at the moment, the public are losing faith with science. And even the scientists, with your great work that has been done in proteonomics, people are going to discredit it because you're part of the scientific community. No, no. Well, the thing is, that's not, I think that's not accurate, Philip. So the thing is, how you, so your question is, how do we resolve it? Right. Yes. So the answer is, so we did that, uh, we showed it in the resource center of the German Human Genome Project, and I was involved in many initiatives to establish what are called biobanks or resource centers, right? So essentially what they are and what I was recommending, I was on the Government Advisory Science Council in Ireland for all of its 10 years, right? Um, and, you know, and in Germany and I advised in the EU and in America and everywhere is it's very simple that if there is a certain amount of research funding in any area, right? It doesn't matter what area it is, that the men and women of the, the society says, well, maybe uh, 5% is set aside for looking at the integrity and that everything that's published uh, has to, the men and women who are the authors of it are liable under the law. It's, it's the same thing for everyone, that if you write something that's not true, that can be in law, right? It's act in honor, right? And then it just means that if you write something that's deceptive or misrepresentation or fraudulent, that you are accountable in law. So, so a trial by jury, the standard in the natural law everywhere is like seven years, right, in prison. For, for, so really, if you publish something um, and it's fraud or misrepresentation or it can't be repeated, then really everyone is accountable. And if there is a system of integrity, just someone else in the world, or it could be systematic, that it's, so in the case, what I have proposed is very simple. Whoever submits something, you would say in the publication, the positive control and the negative control, it's very simple in science. You have to have like a series of positive and negative controls. Mm -hmm. And you'd say the output of the experiment is a PCR test that diagnoses tuberculosis or an antibody that binds a protein CA125, that will be a diagnostic test for ovarian cancer, right? Or whatever it is. Or if it is um, a computer model generated by Imperial College that will accurately look at the deaths in the world, right? 
they would have to have like a positive control, a negative control. So say if it was the computer model, you could run a template program on the uh, worldometer uh, data and then look at specific examples and that verify it, that it accurately predicted or that it did what it said, right? Now, if you have people involved in research integrity, that is very easy to do. And so what I've been saying for 30 years, and it's the same now, that all promotions should be based on people's integrity index or reproducibility index, and that everybody's publication is that no publication is really accepted to be part of your curriculum vitae unless it can be shown to be re 